So we will start just by setting a positive motivation for our time. This is something that we will learn more about as the class goes on, the importance of motivation. But for now, we can think that when we engage in an activity, the motivation that we have going into it plays a large role in the benefit that we get out of it. So if we go into an activity with a narrow motivation and we are looking in the course of engaging in that activity, we are looking to fulfill that narrow motivation and that regardless of what's actually happening, that is what we will get out of it. If we go into some activity with a vast, expansive motivation, then that is what we will look for, that is what we will be interested in, and that is what we will ultimately get out of that activity, even if it's a very simple activity. So we will start all of our classes with intentionally setting a broad motivation. So just think, to begin with, think about your actual motivation, the actual thoughts and feelings that you had half an hour ago uh, coming into the class, what motivated you. And now take an opportunity to try to broaden that motivation. May just have been a curiosity, but we can intentionally try to make it more expansive so we can think that we hope to find some tool, some technique, some idea that we can use to be of greater benefit to others in some way. So just on your own, try to set a broad motivation. All right, so we will get started. So we will be together for four weeks uh, with this class. And tonight we will focus first on kind of setting the stage for what we will do. This class is a broad level overview of mainly Buddhist philosophy. Um, there's another class called Meditation 101 uh, that we'll do next month, uh, same time, for another four weeks, and that class will focus on Buddhist meditation. So the two together are part of what we call Buddhism Made Simple. Um, so those two combined give you a, a pretty good sense of things from a very, very introductory, broad overview perspective. And what we're going to do tonight, what, where we will start, is in talking about the historical Buddha, the life of the Buddha, and what we can take from the life of the Buddha, what kind of inspiration, what kind of guidance we can take from his life story. Uh, because as we will see as we go through the course, Everything uh, 
uh, all of the content of what we call Buddhism came from the direct insights of the historical Buddha. And then over the millennia, we, you know, there's other uh, teachers that came along who provided commentaries and useful ways of thinking about what the Buddha said. But the essence, the real root of the material all comes from the direct uh, observations and experiences of the historical Buddha. So Buddhism, uh, we will see uh, the ways in which Buddhism is different uh, than the other major religious traditions. One of those ways is that Buddhism is not a revealed teaching. It is, again, just the direct experience of the historical Buddha. So what Buddhists, people who now are called Buddhists, who initially for a long time were really just called inner beings, uh, what these practitioners are really ultimately trying to do is to follow in the Buddha's footsteps, to replicate the insights that the Buddha had. Uh, because he spent his whole life after achieving enlightenment, which is an idea that we will go into and explain in this course, he spent his whole life telling people how to do that, how to, in a scientific, methodological, step-by-step -step way, go about uh, getting the same insights that he himself got. So that's what, that's where we'll start, is the life of the Buddha, and then we'll move into uh, his, uh, his, initial, his initial teachings. So any kind of um, general questions so far, or programming questions, or anything that would be helpful before we get into the material more? No. Okay. All right. So the Buddha was born. So kind of right off the bat, we can say that we we often refer to this person as the Buddha. And that is a title. Uh, that is not his name, that is not what he was known as initially. Uh, he was born, uh, as it says here on the slide, his name was Siddhartha Gautama. So that was his, his birth name. And he was born into what is often called a royal family. But we do have to kind of temper our understanding of that phrase, because we often think of that in terms of, you know, say the British monarchy, these sort of grand kingdoms. And what we are talking about, historically speaking, is the area in roundabout what is present day India and present day Nepal. Uh, that, that geographic area, those geopolitical regions didn't exist 25, 2600 years ago, but that's the geographic area that we're talking about. And the way that that area was organized was more, was much closer to small sort of city states. Um, so when we say that he was born into a royal family, it's true as far as as historians understand that 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 family that he was born into did uh, have control over did have responsibility for a, an area in this region but it was much more provincial than we might think when we bring to mind the idea of royal so much smaller and and more simple than than what we might think. But it is true that, relatively speaking, his family and his station in life were elevated compared to the common person uh, at the time. 
that. So, and we are talking about about 25, 2600 years ago uh, from today in this border region between present-day India and present-day Nepal. His mother passed away uh, shortly after giving birth to him. And there are stories about um, that, that the actual birth was, you know, painless and that there were uh, dreams and auspicious signs that preceded the birth. So that, in a way, that goes into a distinction that you find. We will talk maybe toward the end of today's class and next week's class. We'll go into a bit about how Buddhism is understood and practiced globally, the differences in the traditions there. Um, our center, the Thupten Norbu Ling, is coming from the Tibetan tradition. And so everything that we present here at our center is informed by the way that Buddhism is understood and practiced, particularly in that tradition. And within that tradition, even there are sub-schools, and we uh, are most closely associated with what's called the Gulug tradition. Um, there are other sub-schools of Tibetan Buddhism. So, um, and so getting back to this idea of these uh, auspic auspicious signs and so on, um, from the Tibetan Buddhist perspective, that's an indication of the way that the life of the Buddha is understood, which is actually that that the mind of the Buddha had achieved enlightenment prior to this particular lifetime. Uh, the Buddha showed the aspect of engaging in a path of training that culminated in a visible enlightenment. Um, that is a difference. There are among Buddhism, within Buddhism globally, not all traditions see that in the same way. There are traditions who do take the view that he was born totally ordinary and did achieve enlightenment in that lifetime. Other schools take the view that he showed the aspect of how to achieve enlightenment, but had already achieved enlightenment. So that's just something to be aware of. So what is the first piece of information that's relevant about the Buddha's early life is related to his station in life in the sense that, um, Again, there's another story that at the time of the Buddha's birth, his father, because again, his mother had passed away, but that his father took him to what you might call like a, a seer, a spiritual clairvoyant, um, to get kind of a reading on his life. And this seer... Uh, foretold that the Buddha, the, the person who would become the Buddha, was going to go in either, you know, one of two directions, that he was a very special person and that he, his life could take one of two tracks. One of those tracks would be uh, if he were to ascend to his father's position he would be successful in uniting these small city-states that pervaded this region into one kind of monolithic entity, one uh, kind of force, one kind of geopolitical force, using the tools of uh, 
democracy and perhaps war and conquering and that kind of way of uh, being in the world. But this seer also could tell that there was another option, which is that, that this person, Siddhartha, would reject that path and would instead go on a more spiritual journey. And this seer told his father that if he did that, that he would have the same level of success in uniting the people uh, of this region, but that he would do it in a shared philosophical, religious perspective. Um, and, and what's important about that is that his father was very interested in having Siddhartha ascend to his position uh, and not so interested in this spiritual idea. So that informed all of Siddhartha's early life uh, in, in the sense that his father took great pains, took great effort to shield him from the world, to provide him with a great deal of comfort and activity, uh, things to do, worldly delights, and to, to kind of keep him, you know, interested in the family business rather than investigating the wider world and seeing what was out there and perhaps pursuing some other perspective. And that worked for a while, that worked. He, he uh, Siddhartha, you know, he got married, he had children, he participated in this kind of what his father wanted up until his late 20s. Um, and then he got really curious about, you know, more and more interested in, more and more curious about the wider world. And at, uh, at, at, at one point, he left the sort of family compound and traveled to the nearby town. And there, it said that he came across what are called the four sites, um, these four different uh, things that he, four different people, four different, you could say, existential conditions uh, that uh, exist in the world. And these, um, you know, the first three of these, uh, old age, sickness, and death. So these are things that he came across in the sense that he, it said that he saw one particularly extremely old person, um, someone who was very affected by old age, very frail, um, very weak. Um, and then he saw someone who was very visibly ill could be perhaps a leper or someone um, you know, who just was very clear from their outward expression, their outward perspective, that they weren't just kind of normally ill, but that they were suffering from a very intense kind of illness. And then he saw a funeral procession, an open air funeral procession, which is still very common in that region, um, these open-air carts with uh, the dead body. And these three conditions, these first three conditions, are all things that we have all also had to come to terms with. Um, what is different, in a way, is that Siddhartha was shielded um, in a more extreme or perhaps an abnormal kind of way from these realities of life. Uh, for, for us, we come across these when we're five, when we're 10, you know, we most likely have attended our first funeral, you know, in that time frame and 
Uh, and so these questions, these realities are something that we confront under the guidance of our parents and, and generally at a young age. But Siddhartha was in his late 20s um, when he realized really for the first time. Um, and again, of course, as I mentioned, um, this depends on your perspective. It, it was the mind of this person already enlightened or was they really, you know, so, but the way that I'm describing this is that this is, this is the outward aspect, at least of what uh, happened. What was happening internally is perhaps a different story, but um, outwardly, for the first time, he was confronted with, he was um, wrestling with the fact that he himself would age and not just you know, age in a normal, you know, not just become 30 or 40 or 50, but actually, if he was lucky enough, he would have to inevitably experience that kind of frailty, that kind of uh, ravage of being, say, 80, 90 years old. Um, and very likely at at some time, he would become extremely ill, or he his loved ones would become extremely ill. And he himself and all of his loved ones would have to experience death. Um, and it was quite, you know, dealing with all of that is quite shocking. Uh, or, you know, it, it, we can all remember in our own lives that, that this was a turning point. Um, in, in a young person's life when you realize, you know, that your parents will die and that you will die. Um, but we can imagine even more so under these circumstances. So this was a real shift um, for Siddhartha in his journey, in his journey through life, in that he became extremely motivated to do something about this, these existential conditions that he himself, uh, he himself faced, faced, and he recognized that all of his loved ones would face. So then the fourth site is, um, here the word mendicant is, is used, uh, a spiritual seeker, a spiritual aspirant, or mendicant he is another person that he came across uh, in the town that he traveled to. And, you know, there was something about this person, something about their demeanor, and perhaps we can analogize it to our own experiences of, of seeing His Holiness the Dalai Lama or other great spiritual masters on TV or um, in videos and things, we can sense that that they have an inner knowledge, an inner quality, an inner capacity that is, you know, a bit abnormal. It's not, it's um, something that they've really cultivated over time. And there was something about this spiritual aspirant, because uh, at, at um, in the in this region, the Nepali, uh, Indian kind of region, uh, there were many existent spiritual traditions at the time. And this person was just a member of one of those traditions and had gone off, um, had left their lay life, had devoted themselves to meditation and the study of their mind. Um, and had, got, had gotten some results from that, that, the, that uh, Siddhartha was able to discern by being around this person. And so one can get the sense that, that Siddhartha kind of felt like, given these existential threats and conditions, that this person maybe they knew something, maybe that was the direction to go in. Um, if 
he was going to fulfill his aspiration to do something about these existential conditions, maybe that was the right direction to move in. So he then renounced his titles. He renounced his station in life, left his family, and became another one of these wandering uh, mendicants. So that is, in terms of the first part of the Buddha's life story, that, that covers that. Any, uh, any thoughts or questions so far? I have one. I, I have maybe a couple. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Was um, Siddhartha's birth um, prophesized? Prophesized? You mean like by an by a previous person or by, by a previous Buddha? You know, I mean, there were. I don't. There were. It's understood that um, Siddhartha. I mean, of course, it depends on what you mean by Buddha. That gets a little bit complicated because there are anyone anyone who achieves full enlightenment um, is a Buddha. And but then there are also what are called wheel turning Buddhas. The the historical Buddha was a wheel turning Buddha, which is kind of a special kind of Buddha, a Buddha with unique karma to impact the world in a much more profound way than just some regular person who happens to achieve full enlightenment. Um, So they're the same in one way, but they're different in another way. And the historical Buddha is understood not to be the first um, wheel turning, but there's there's others. There's um, Kashapya, and there's I mean there's there's a whole list of other um, Buddhas, and I just don't. I haven't really studied all of that history. I think it's likely. Um, certainly, certainly, the historical Buddha has prophesied the coming of the next Buddha, um, Buddha Maitreya. Uh, so I think it's quite likely that there is a prophecy in some text by a previous Buddha um, that talked about the age of Shakyamuni Buddha, just like Shakyamuni Buddha talks talks about the age of the next Buddha, Buddha Maitreya. Um, but I don't know, like, the specific name of that Buddha or, like, the specific text that you can find that in. Thank you. Any other questions? So I have just a couple pictures um, to show, kind of to, to backtrack a little bit. Um, so I said that he was born, um, he's born in what's present day Lumbini uh, in Nepal. It's right on the border between um, India and present day India, present day Nepal. And that town, um, this is what's called the Maya Devi Temple. It's thought that we know kind of roughly where um, Maya, his mother, uh, gave birth to Siddhartha. It was outside, um, it was sort of in a, a grove of trees uh, where she kind of stopped and gave birth. Uh, and so this temple uh, is built, uh, has been built on what is thought to be that location. Uh, And then there's some pictures uh, inside. These are just inside the temple. And this is said to be the actual paving stone um, that where where his mother gave birth. So I don't know how how 
much confidence we have in that, but that's the understanding. So then to go back to, to jump forward again in time, back to after the Buddha or Siddhartha. I have, I have trouble referring to the Buddha as Siddhartha, but it's just my own problem. Um, after Siddhartha decided to renounce his titles and so on, he then entered into this phase of uh, showing the aspect, again, of becoming a wanderer, a spiritual seeker, and following the kinds of spiritual traditions that were common at the time, that were common to um, common to the spiritual traditions of India and Nepal at the time. And a lot of those traditions had to do with um, kind of punishing the body. That was one of the prevailing views at the time was that uh, if you deprived yourself of sleep for long periods, if you stood in cold running, you know, rushing rivers for long periods, if you went uh, without food and so on, then if you kind of tried to join that with meditation and prayer and those sorts of things, then the, the theory was in a way that perhaps by punishing the body, the spirit could break through or transcend in some way. And so Siddhartha, that being one of the prevailing views, that's what Siddhartha did for a long time. That was, um, that was what his teacher did, and that's what people did. So he did that. And what he found was that it wasn't particularly effective, um, that starving oneself, going without sleep and so on, doesn't really work all that well for actually transforming the mind. Um, and so there was um, there was a time when it's said that, and you can find not not so much in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, this particular artistic representation, but what's called the starving, you know, the starving Buddha, although it represents Siddhartha before, you know, just before he achieved enlightenment. Um, you can find in like some of the Thai temples and other places uh, depictions um, of a really, really emaciated. Uh, depiction. And that refers to this period of time where he was engaging in these really extreme ascetic practices. And there was a particular time where he was quite close to death. Um, and it's said that he saw um, a musician uh, on a raft coming down the river where he was, you know, next to where he was meditating. And this musician was playing some sort of stringed instrument. Uh, and to Siddhartha, the sound was really very beautiful. And his insight uh, was that that extremely beautiful music could only be generated because the instrument that that musician was using was tuned to the right place. Um, the strings weren't so loose that no sound was made, and they weren't so tight that a very harsh sound was made. And he was able to use that insight to recognize that he had kind of gone too far, that his asceticism was harming himself. Um, and 
that his practice was never really going to be fruitful as long as he was hungry and tired and sleep deprived. So this came to be related to one way of understanding what's called the middle way doctrine. There's other ways of understanding that, um, but one is freedom from extremes. Um, the extreme here between hedonism and asceticism. So, you know, engaging in practice with effort and with discipline, but at the same time, taking care of oneself. Um, he came to see that that was important. So at this time, he uh, took food and, you know, kind of revived himself. Uh, and it was only after that that he was able to achieve enlightenment. It was only um, after that that he traveled to Bodh Gaya. And um, so I have, this might be hard to, hard to see, but this, this represents, um, I can, maybe you can see it a bit better. So this represents um, his travel from Lumbini to Bodh Gaya, where he did achieve enlightenment. So he was, as I said, born in Lumbini, and you can see that it's just right across the border uh, to what is you know, present-day Nepal, present-day India, and then achieved enlightenment in Bodh Gaya. So, so uh, I have some pictures then also of Bodh Gaya. And why don't I just make these easy to see as well? This is um, understood to be, uh, this is what's, this picture is what's called the Bodhi tree. And my understanding is that it is something like a sapling of a sapling of a sapling of a sapling of the original tree where the Buddha rested and showed the aspect of achieving enlightenment. So it's not the actual, you know, the same tree, but it's a genetic uh, off, offspring or offshoot of that tree. Uh, and it's still, you know, that's a relatively recent picture. You can, people go on pilgrimage to Bodh Gaya, the Bodhi tree is there. Uh, and then there's other pictures. So this is where this Bodh Gaya, of course, it looks, you know, it's been built up and it's a pilgrimage site now, but um, this is where the Buddha achieved enlightenment uh, in Bodh Gaya. And then from Bodh Gaya, his first teaching was in Sarna, um, or which is also quite near Var Varanasi. Uh, so so I guess I always say that I have to assume that there's a bridge on that river because I don't, you know, but he traveled from Bodh Gaya to Sarnath after his enlightenment to give his first teaching, the teaching on the four noble truths, which we have a retreat on next weekend. Uh, we, we call it a weekend intensive. I like retreat. Uh, sounds nicer to me, uh, but we have a weekend teaching on the Four Noble Truths next weekend. Uh, so this just shows you that he traveled 148 miles to, uh, to go from Bodh Gaya to Sarnath.
And then I have some pictures of Sarna. Okay. Any thoughts or questions so far? I know that we've used the word enlightenment quite a few times so far, and we haven't really, that's something that, of course, by the end of this class, you will have a, you know, reasonable understanding of um, what it means to achieve enlightenment. Um, we can say that it it is the um, highest the highest possible state, the spiritual state um, that any person can achieve. Um, it it represents the complete perfection of the mind. Uh, so that is what the Buddha uh, discovered, uh, because again, in that, in a way, that also goes back to another one of these major distinctions between Buddhism and other major religious traditions, uh, in the sense that uh, Buddhism is not a theistic religion; it doesn't have at its core the idea of a creator being. It uh, accepts the idea of mind or consciousness being a phenomena that exists. Um, and what the Buddha discovered um, with, you know, of course, with the help of other Buddhas in previous, you, you can read, you know, the Jataka tales and all of the the lifetimes that the Buddha had to go through to um, ultimately uncover this truth or this uh, thing that a, that, a, that a person is capable of. But the idea essentially is that enlightenment, this perfection of the mind, is a completely natural and normal state that nature simply permits. Um, the mind is a natural phenomena that exists within nature, and the state of enlightenment is one way in which consciousness can exist. It can also exist, as it does for us, as what in Buddhism is called ordinary consciousness, unenlightened consciousness. These are just simply options that nature allows, just like nature allows for a person to, uh, you know, either learn how to play chess or not learn how to play chess. That assumes that chess is something that is understood by people, um, that the rules are understood, and that that kind of knowledge, and then that you could say that that's a body of knowledge, um, you know, how to play chess, you could describe as a body of knowledge, how to play the violin is a body of knowledge. And it has to exist um, in order for a person to be able to do it. Just like for us, the teachings that the Buddha gave have to be present in our world. Um, if they weren't, then even though they may be present, perhaps you could say in other worlds, if we accept the idea that other worlds exist, that doesn't do much good for us right now. In order for us right now to practice it, that wisdom, that knowledge has to exist on our planet while we are also inhabiting that planet. But if it does, then that's just something that 
people can do. Uh, so it's true then that, uh, that there are worlds where these teachings don't exist, just like there are, again, if we want to accept the, the idea that there are multiple worlds and so on, um, then it's, it is true that many sentient beings exist in places without these teachings, um, just like many sentient beings exist in places without chess. Um, it, the, the import, though, of course, is much greater when, uh, when you're talking about these, this body of knowledge, this wisdom, because this is the wisdom, this is the body of knowledge that, as we'll see with the Four Noble Truths, um, allows a sentient being to, as, as was the Buddha's intent, to find a solution to the existential threat of sickness, aging, and death. Um, those are existential threats that are only faced by ordinary sentient beings, um, by sentient beings who are, and all of these things, you know, they, they all take time to unpack, to explain, to understand in more detail. Um, but yeah, so maybe we'll just kind of go into a little bit about the Four Noble Truths rather than, you know, kind of do that in a more, um, more orderly fashion. But so the Four Noble Truths being the first teaching of the historical Buddha that was given at Sarnath is kind of the evolution of where we are with things. But any, uh, any thoughts or questions so far? Yeah. Um, can mm -hmm. you tell me uh, his approximate age when he did the Four no Noble Truths? So he was he was in his late twenties when he left um, the kingdom, and so I think they generally say that he was in his mid thirties, roughly thereabouts. Um, it was maybe about seven years or so, um, six, seven years of this kind of, this period that we talked about, the ascetic period. Um, so they generally say that he was in his mid to late 30s, um, somewhere in that, in, that, uh, in that range. And then he started, yeah, he started teaching um, roundabout then, roundabout when he was about 39, 40, so, um, so he was yeah, mid to late, um, mid to late thirties is, is the best, you know, kind of that we, we can guess, I think is from the, from the teachings. So the Four Noble Truths, this, it, um, it all becomes quite complicated kind of right off the bat with the Four Noble Truths because uh, what we will see is that in a, in a way, because just the word noble itself doesn't mean noble in the sense that we use it. When we say noble, we mean has nobility, you know, um, and, and that isn't, these are not four noble ideas. Um, what is meant by the phrase, the four noble truths, 
is that the word noble is actually an English translation. And this, this will come up for the whole time that you study Buddhism, that the fact that we're stuck with um, words that were, you know, given in one language and then translated into another language and then translated into another language and then finally translated into English. Uh, and everybody just kind of did the best they could to pick the best meaning of things. So noble is a translation of the word aria, which doesn't refer to the idea, but it refers to the person who had the idea. So the four noble truths are the four truths for an Arya being. Um, and an Arya being, you could say, then in English we would say a noble being, perhaps. But it might just be more accurate or more technical to just say an Arya being um, is a person who has trained their mind to see the nature of reality directly. And that is, that will, that subject will be the subject of the very last class in this series, but we're really going to put a pin in it until that class. But because it takes about 45 minutes or so to kind of explain in a way that's not confusing or as, as not confusing as is possible. Um, so, and that realization, that meditative realization of seeing the nature of reality directly is what Buddhists are trying to do. Um, that's ultimately the goal of Buddhist practice. Uh, and yet there is still a distinction, another technical distinction between an Arya being and an enlightened being. Um, but that distinction only refers really to the repetition of that insight. Um, an enlightened being has repeated that insight in meditation more deeply, more often, and has become more deeply familiar with it than an Arya being. An Arya being has perhaps seen the nature of reality directly maybe only once. Um, and then at that moment, they become an Arya being, but they're not an enlightened being. Uh, but still, it's a radical shift from an ordinary being to an Arya being. And when an Arya being looks at reality, they would say that reality can be described in these four ways. Um, and we probably have all heard of the Four Noble Truths, and we probably have heard formulations of the Four Noble Truths. There are different formulations, different ways of phrasing the four. Um, you may have heard life is suffering or there is suffering um, as the First Noble Truth. Many people, um, I guess I'm one of the many, feel like the most useful way of thinking about or phrasing the Four Noble Truths is how uh, it will be laid out in this class. And for the first, that is to say, not to say life is suffering or there is suffering, but to say true suffering to say that the first thing that the Buddha taught is, is true suffering, which, because, again, these four truths are the four things that are seen to be or known to be true by an Arya being. As ordinary beings, we have our own version of the four noble truths. We have our own our own way of looking at reality and describing it, we would describe it perhaps in a similar way as we go through the four, you know, we'll see that 
we have our own version of these. And the problem from the perspective of the Buddha is that these are different, um, that the way that an ordinary being defines suffering is different than the way that an Arya being defines suffering. Or that, or that, of course, then by extension, how an enlightened being would define suffering, because there's no, again, that difference is really just the depth and the repetition of that insight. But it's not, it's not like some new something else that they have to do. All they have to do really is repeat that insight until it transforms the mind more deeply. Um, so for an Arya being, true suffering is divided into these three categories, uh, three ways of understanding what true, what real suffering or true suffering is. And the first isn't particularly controversial or difficult. It's called the suffering of pain or the suffering of suffering. And here, what's meant is all overt physical and mental distress, any kind of unwished for physical or mental experience. So anything from getting a splinter to losing a job to, you know, the death of a loved one, to, you know, not being able to go on a particular vacation um, that you were looking forward to. All forms of physical or mental unsatisfactory conditions, things that we, we, would, we would wish when we experience it for it to not be what we are experiencing. Um, so not controversial, not difficult to understand. This is something that all sentient beings experience really almost every day in some, at least in a minor way, some kind of disappointment, some kind of frustration, some kind of anxiety or challenge that we, we wish we didn't have to experience. It's the second category that things change in a more dramatic way and, and it becomes more, it becomes different than what we think of. Because if you were to ask a person on the street, what is suffering? Every answer, they would give you thousands and thousands of different answers. They would all fall, fall under the first category, the suffering of pain for an ordinary random person. The suffering of change is more important um, and, and bears thinking about more deeply. Reason being that everything that an Arya being puts into the suffering of change as a category is a thing that an ordinary person like us would label as happiness. So getting what we want, you know, being in contact with things that are pleasurable, with things that we, being able to eat the kinds of foods that we like, being able to listen to the kinds of music that we like, having good weather, having other people say nice things about us, uh, getting the right kind of job, uh, anything like this, anything that we, anything that an ordinary being would kind of say is the point of their life. Like, what is it that they are striving for? What do they want more of? What is it that they, um, you know, what, why do they have a job? Why, why are they working to get money? It's really so that they can afford the kinds of outer conditions that they enjoy. Um, spending time with their loved ones, all of these things. 
And so this is where the real disconnect comes from. Um, that if an Arya being is saying that from their perspective, everything that we think is happiness is in the suffering of change, then somebody is really mistaken in a fundamental way about how to be happy, about what to do in order to give rise to happiness. We think, ordinary beings think, that if we can amass a good reputation, a reasonable amount of physical comfort, a reasonable amount of resources, um, a good number of friends, a fulfilling job, a partner, all of these things, that that is the good life. And that, and that bringing all of these things together is really the point of, of our lives. Um, and the reason when we say suffering of change, there are different ways in which we can understand this. One way of understanding this is that these conditions are temporary. That's not ultimately really what's meant by the suffering of change, but that that's still something that we can bring into our understanding of this is that no matter what job we have, no matter how much wealth we have, no matter how much status we have, um, that all of those experiences are temporary in their nature. They will end. Um, they are fleeting in their na nature, even if they last for the entirety of a single lifetime. Buddhism asserts that we will still die. Uh, and then what? You know, then we will be separated from those conditions. So from that perspective, no matter what it is, it's temporary. But the real meaning of the suffering of change is that all of these experiences, if we engage in them for longer than we intend, for longer than we might hope for or wish for, the experience itself becomes unpleasant. The experience itself starts to be experienced by that person as painful. So it changes into something unsatisfactory. So we can think about you know, our favorite movie or our favorite album or our favorite person, um, you know, our favorite activity, our favorite whatever. And we can recognize that if we were chained to that person, there would come a point where we would strongly wish not to be chained to that person. We we think in our minds that this is my favorite person, that like we, we wake up every day and we look forward to talking to them. We look forward to hanging out with them or we think about our favorite food and we, you know, we obsess about, oh, I get to have, you know, whatever it is today. Um, and yet, if we had our favorite food for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then the next day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then the next day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, we would start to really have a negative reaction to that food. We would crave some other kind of food. And so this is a real problem that if everything that we are striving to be in contact with is capable of becoming unpleasant, then we can see that its nature, its essential essence, is not pleasure. 
um, if it was, if, if at its core, at its root, that object, an object here doesn't mean inanimate, it just means something that exists, could be another person, could be some social condition, if that truly was in the nature of happiness, contentment, pleasure, then the longer that we were in contact with it, the happier we would become. It wouldn't be capable of giving rise to any sense of unsatisfactoriness. And yet that's not our experience. We can prove this to ourselves by listening to our favorite album and then playing it again, listening to it again and then playing it again and seeing at what point do I not want to listen to that again? Um, at what point do I not want to talk to this person or eat this food or be at the beach? Um, so what we are really doing then is jumping from one fleeting experience to another and then jumping to another and really we're trying to spend our whole lives on this kind of treadmill um, of hedonistic experiences where we do something and then we try to end it um, and that's really the best case scenario you know worst case scenario is we want something and it's not available, or it's not as good as we thought it was, um, or we get uh, upset that it didn't last for as long as it did. But the best case scenario is we get exactly what we want. We can engage with it for exactly the duration that we intend, and then we find something else to distract ourselves with. Um, and so there's kind of um, what what the Buddha, and you know, you could say what the Arya beings, what the Buddha is observing here, is that what's really going on is that at the moment that we engage in some sort of pleasure-seeking behavior, whether it's calling someone on the phone or going to the beach, doesn't matter what it is, at that moment, we were motivated to engage in that action because we were experiencing some kind of overt dissatisfaction. We were experiencing boredom or hunger or restlessness or anxiety or depression or some some kind of state was arising in our mind that we felt was unpleasant and we felt like we needed to do something about the unpleasantness of that moment so we were like okay what do i have access to i could call this person i could eat this thing I could drink this thing, I could watch this thing, I could listen to this thing. These are, this is sort of the universe of what's possible for me in this moment. And then we pick one and then we try to do it. Um, and then again, best case scenario, we get what, you know, the person picks up or the movie is actually playing, we can get the ticket. You know, best case scenario, we do the thing that we wanted. And then what, is happening according to the Buddha is that that new stimulus that we've introduced is, is new. And at the first moment, that previously felt dissatisfied state is being overwhelmed by this new stimulus. And so what happens is that this, the boredom, the hunger, it had been on an incline. It had been getting worse and worse. And then it reaches a point where we feel like we need to do something. We do something, we introduce this new stimulus, and then that 
previous unsatisfactory state starts to go down. We're eating food, so we're less hungry. We're talking to someone, so we're less bored, what have you. The new stimulus is reducing the previously felt unsatisfactory state. But the new stimulus comes along with its own suffering experience that's unique to that new experience. So food comes along with the suffering of being overly full. Um, and the friend that we're talking to comes along with, you know, kind of the dissatisfaction of all of their quirks and, you know, their, the things that they do that like get on our nerves a little bit. And, you know, we don't notice those right away. Just like when we first start to eat the first bite of food, we don't think about, well, if I keep doing this, my stomach's going to become painful and distended. Just like when we start talking to that person, we're just kind of relieved. We just, we have this sense of, the boredom has been relieved, just like the hunger has been relieved. And that momentary relief, we label as happiness. We think of that as the point. We think of that because that's the easy thing. That's, that's the, you know, that's the thing that when we're babies, when we're toddlers, like we get the lollipop, we get the you know, we get put in front of the television. That's kind of the surface level, easy thing that we've learned and that we've kind of internalized as being kind of all that there is. And if that's all that there is, then that's all that we ever try to do is get these momentary relief, reliefs from agitation that's arising in the mind. Um, but then, as that new stimulus goes on and on in our experience, the suffering that is incumbent or unique to that new experience, that will start to become more and more noticeable. The suffering of being full, the suffering of, you know, dealing with this person who has their imperfections, what have you, the suffering of knowing that oh, the next song is coming and, then, you know, I've heard it before or, you know, whatever it is, um, that becomes more and more noticeable the longer our relationship to that new stimulus goes on. And at some point, just like before, it will reach a critical point and we will feel like we have to do something new. We have to introduce yet a new stimulus to get relief from what we had introduced previously. And this is a real problem um, from, from the perspective of the Buddha, because we are labeling all of these things as happiness. And the Buddha is saying, no, these are just objects that change into suffering because suffering is at their is at their root. Suffering is at their core. And yes, of course, if we stop, if we always can stop, then we never actually experience that. If we can just get a little hit of this thing and a little hit of this thing and that thing, then we never actually experience that, you know. But from the Buddhist perspective, still we die, right? Still it's possible if we have a lot of resources and a lot of good luck and well, Buddhism would say, you know, good karma, but you know, a lot of, a lot of things come together cooperatively. Maybe we can spend our whole life getting these little hits here and there, but then we still die. And did we use that life constructively? Did we use that life in a beneficial way or did we just use it to become more familiar with this process of jumping from one thing to another to another and reinforce this idea that that's all that there is and that's, that's the best that it can be? 
Um, the Buddhist perspective is that we're mistaken if we think it's the best that, that it, it can be, and that we're shortchanging ourselves by choosing the suffering of change rather than choosing real happiness. Um, and that's something that we'll maybe try to unpack more as we go along. Um, but, you know, definitely something that bears real reflection, because, you know, of course, it's not my job to try to convince anyone of anything. Um, I'm just trying to present perspectives, and we have to reflect on them and say, is, do I agree with this? Is this valid in my own direct experience? Um, can I see that this is true in my own direct experience? Um, that's ultimately the point. That's ultimately what we have to do uh, if we want to, to make changes, you know, in the future. Um, we have to, you know, the, the Four Noble Truths are um, guidelines that we have to try to internalize and see, can I see that this is true in my own direct experience? And then what do I do about that um, if I do see that it's true in my own direct experience? And then the third is what's called all-pervasive suffering. And the idea here is that there are no kinds of existences or lives anywhere within reality that are not conditioned by the first two categories of suffering, the suffering of pain and the suffering of change, that every ordinary sentient being, no matter who they are or what kind of body or mind they have, if they're an ordinary sentient being, their lives are conditioned by the suffering of pain and the suffering of change. So that's what all pervasive suffering means is that we can't just die and then spontaneously become free from the suffering of pain and the suffering of change. We can become free from the suffering of pain and the suffering of change, but it, it requires intentional cultivation of the antidotes to these stuff to, to, to this condition. Uh, it doesn't just happen spontaneously uh, to any sentient being. Any thoughts or questions on the first noble truth? No. What is happening? Venerable, when you talked about um, the Buddha's birth, there's there's that whole story about the elephant and what is that? What? Yeah, that was like I said, the dream, like the the auspicious dreams that um, yeah, they're just kind of and again that that relates to the the idea, and you know I don't I don't know. Of course, for us, like, you know, a white elephant doesn't have any meaning, but I, you know, I think it was kind of an, um, uh, a way at the time, you know, some, some sort of, at the time, you know, for that culture at that time, the, the meaning that was there, you know, if, if that were to happen now, of course, I think it would be different. I don't think that that it's um that it it has sort of intrinsic meaning i think that it it was understood at that time at that culture to be an auspicious sign and therefore that's what happened um but yeah i don't um yeah i don't know a lot about the that the sort of the origin of um of that auspicious sign and in 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 Indian culture at the time, but yeah, I, the the general idea is that um, it 
portended that the that that the birth wasn't an ordinary birth. Uh, but I think I think it doesn't have anything to do with exactly um, you know which sign uh, you know exactly like that it was a white elephant and that it wasn't something else. Or uh, I just think that that that's because that is what would have been understood to people at that time, and therefore that is how it manifested. So not to be taken literally, that that's what they believed that it was. Yeah, I just think it was, you know, it was, um, re it was relevant to that time and that place and that culture. Um, but it doesn't have any kind of larger or, you know, inherent kind of significance. Any other questions? And talk a bit about uh, the second noble truth. So, just waiting for things to load. So one, we could also talk about this, the idea of the Four Noble Truths um, as being kind of this comprehensive, maybe we'll just do that, um, that, that when we look at the Four Noble Truths, um, the true, you know, true suffering, true origin of suffering, uh, true cessation of suffering, and the true path that leads to the cessation of suffering. That's, um, and again, like I said, there's other ways of packaging. Some people might say the truth of suffering, or um, there is suffering, or and there is a cause, and there is a cessation, and there is. But again, the the presentation that I'll be using is this idea that of talking about it in terms of true suffering, true origin, true cessation, and true path. Because like I said, that mirrors the distinction between an ordinary person's view and an aria person's view, because we also have a sense of suffering. We have a sense of the origin of suffering. We have a sense of the cessation of suffering, and we have a sense of the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. The problem is that we're wrong. The problem is that the way that we think about that is different than the way that an Arya being thinks about that. And that is a problem. Um, because if we follow the ordinary way of thinking about that, then we will never escape from being ordinary. We will continue to be ordinary, which means that we will continue to experience all pervasive suffering. Um, and that is not preferable in comparison to enlightenment, given that nature permits enlightenment. Enlightenment is preferable to being ordinary. Enlightenment is the state beyond suffering, the state of a mind that is perfected in good qualities and is free from any disturbing or afflicted states of mind. And just given that we live in a universe where both are permitted by nature, one is preferable than the other. Um, and so the concept of, and so when we look at true suffering, true origin, true cessation, and true path, what we see is that these get progressively better. These get progressively more hopeful, progressively more uh, optimistic. Because if the Buddha just taught, you know, true suffering and stopped, that would be a real downer. You know, he's just saying that things are not great. Um, and this is this is likened, these four steps are likened 
to the medical, what's called the medical model. So for example, if we feel like we are ill um, and we go to the doctor, if the doctor just says, yep, you're right, you are ill, and then he's done, he or she is done, that's not great because we don't know anything other than there is an illness. Um, what we want is for the doctor to say, to, we do want the doctor to agree with us because if they disagree with us, then we're not on the same page and we don't really know what's happening. So we want them to acknowledge that there's a problem, but we, we want them to then say, and I know what is causing it. You not only do I know that you are ill, but I know what the origin of that illness is. It is a virus. It is a bacteria. It is some, you know, it is this one specific thing. Still, that's not good enough. We, because the doctor could then say, but you're going to die like tomorrow. And I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. That's an option. Like that's a possibility. And that's not great. We don't want we, we wouldn't want our doctor to say that. We would want our doctor to then go on to the third step and say, and I know that this is fixable. I know that there is, that this can be brought to an end, that we can eliminate this from what's happening to you. That's like the third noble truth, the truth of the cessation of suffering. And yet still, even the third noble truth isn't quite sufficient, because we also need our doctor to tell us what is the treatment, what is the medication, what is the surgery, what is it, you know, what changes do we have to make to bring about that cessation? It isn't sufficient for the doctor to say, well, I read about somebody else who got better, or I, you know, there was, I know someone who had this thing and now they don't. Um, we need a, a, a reliable, repeatable method that can bring about that cessation of that illness. So, we have to progress through all four of these noble truths um, if we're really going to do something about, like I said, like the Buddha's intent was to find a solution to sickness, aging, and death. Uh, and the only way that we can do that is we do, in fact, have to study the first noble truth. We do, in fact, have to get really clear on what suffering is, how it manifests, all of the varieties of suffering, so that we can uproot the mistaken idea that suffering is caused by a lack of resources, that suffering is caused by not having the right kind of food and so on. We have to uproot that by understanding that suffering is actually much deeper, much more subtle so that our antidotes, our methods, have to also be subtle and deep and, and really, really effective. So we do have to study the first noble truth, but then we also have to understand what, why is the first noble truth the case? Um, it could just be that it just is, and we don't know why. It just, it's just baked into reality, and it just is. But that, that's not the Buddha's experience. The Buddha's experience is that there is a specific reason that the first noble truth is true. Um, and so that's quite, that, that's more hopeful. We know that it's not just the way things are, that there is one specific cause for it. And then we also know that the Buddha's direct experience is that it is removable, this cause. Once we remove that cause, just like once we get rid of the virus, once we get rid of the bacteria, we return to a state of health. The Buddha's observation is once we uproot the cause of 
of the first noble truth, we're no longer subject to the first noble truth. Um, so, and then the, the last noble truth is that there is, in fact, a body of knowledge. There is, in fact, a regular, repeatable, reliable methodology that will, if we follow it, if we actually do it, it will bring about that cessation of suffering. It will excise that cause of suffering. Um, so we need all four noble truths, and we need to progress through them in that way. But we have to understand that just like a doctor studies, you know, a heart doctor studies heart disease, not to be morbid, but to help people to be well, that we study suffering not to be morbid, but because we know it's removable. We know it can be excised. We know that it's not baked into reality as a whole, um, that there are things that we can do to uproot it in our experience. And that's what the state of enlightenment ultimately is, is, is these methods culminate in the state of enlightenment, um, which is following in the footsteps of the Buddha and getting those same results. Yeah. So, but we will, um, so what we'll see is that that second noble truth, which is where we'll pick up next week, what we'll see as a spoiler um, is that it has to do with not yet having seen the nature of reality directly. Because we've said that that's what an Arya being has done, and that's what an enlightened being has done. So that, the fact that we've not done it, is ultimately that cause. Um, but to understand that takes a very long time, takes decades of effort. Um, but we will at least talk about it a little bit more. Uh, we'll see that that is the, the second noble truth. The origin of suffering is, is our own present moment lack of having seen the nature of reality directly, which I know is not a phrase that means anything yet. Um, that's, that's why I use it, because you can't, you can't layer on top of that some kind of misconception. It doesn't, doesn't have a meaning yet, but it will have a meaning by the time that we finish the class. But we are out of time, but um, any final thoughts or questions? I'd like to personally, personally say thank you. I have found your uh, teaching very interesting and I very much relate to it. So I'm really excited to see how much more I relate to it. I'm really excited. Thank you um, very much. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And so will this class, will this class be every Tuesday, every Thursday for four weeks until yeah, we're we'll, done? Yep. We'll, we meet three more times and then. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Blessings to everybody. Thank you so much. I just want to agree with her <laughs> that it was really a, a wonderful um, learning experience today. Uh, you go into wonderful depth and um, explain things so that I can understand them. So thank you. Very grateful. Sorry, I got to jump on the bandwagon. I have taken this course three times. Thanks. I'm finally getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, well, Ben. I, I have I have done it about nine times, so that's probably why. <laughs> I don't know if this question is relatable, but I remember when I first started looking up Buddhism, I bumped into a documentary called The Daughters of Wisdom. And I want, I'm curious, how, how does woman 
come into this as it is mm, male dominant? I don't know. I've never heard of that particular um, documentary. Um, I can say that the Buddha didn't really, I mean, it, it's true. It is true that almost every human civilization has ended up being patriarchal. Um, and it is true that that has influenced that, that just sort of objective reality about human society has influenced um, Buddhism as it has influenced everything. Um, the, the Buddha himself, um, you know, there's nothing really in his teachings um, where there's any real distinction between male and female. You find some um, later patriarchal thinkers who bring uh -huh. into, you know, bring into it kind, kind of, um, so the history, the 2,500 years of history and the fact that we have to contend with, um, you know, the number of enlightened beings being quite few and the number of unenlightened beings being overwhelming, we, you know, we have to contend with the influence of patriarchy in Buddhist structures. That is absolutely, unfortunately, the reality of, of the situation. But you don't find that thinking in the teachings of the Buddha. Um, he ordained women um, when he was alive, um, just like he ordained men when he was alive into, you know, into the, the holy life. Um, and there is no, there's no real, the, the mind is what achieves enlightenment. Um, and the mind is neither male nor female. Um, it's so, um, but but it is true that we were stuck with human systems that are fallible and that are patriarchal in nature, uh, in many cases. Mm, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, may I ask you one more question? Um, have you, uh, since you've been doing this, has a human? Uh, literally come up to you and said, hey, I believe that I am an unenlightened one. And what do I do with this? Um, I don't, I mean, people ask all the time, like, how does a person know? Um, and I don't, I don't really, I, that's hard to, to, um, to know. I can say that from the Buddhist perspective, like a fully enlightened being, um, is someone who is completely om omniscient, um, and so they can know all things. They, they know the minds of other people directly, um, and they, they know the past, they know the, the, the future. So there are kind of qualitative capacities of mind that an enlightened being can access that an ordinary being can't access. Um, but another way of thinking about that is that is the idea of Buddha nature, um, the idea that every sentient being has the seed or the capacity to become enlightened. And that is absolutely true. Um, we all have the innate uh, potential to, to become enlightened. And in, in one way of thinking, it's true that 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 perfected mind is already present, but it is also true that simultaneously it's obscured by the afflicted states. So to the extent that the afflicted states exist, we are not really in tune with that essential aspect of our mind. But all we, all that we're really doing with the Buddhist path is uncovering, is removing those veils, removing those obscurations. We're not really adding anything new to the mind. We're not doing something or bringing something into the mind that's not already there. We're just taking away 
all of the causes and the conditions that prevent us from being in tune with what is already there. So, but it, to the extent that the afflictions do operate, to the extent that we have jealousy and rage and ill will and covetousness and maliciousness, and to the extent that those are part of our experience, we can't say that we are actually enlightened. We can say we have the potential. We can say that we have that seed. Um, but and and we do need to nurture and nourish and grow that seed, and that is our job. That is the job of being a Buddhist: is to honor and acknowledge that potential and to nourish and grow that potential. But it is it is also the case that there are these qualitative capacities that are unique to enlightened beings. Um, so I'm not clairvoyant. I, you know, and so I know that I'm, you know, I, I know that I have the capacity, but I also know that I'm not omniscient. I'm not clairvoyant. I, you know, so I know that I have those, um, that those limitations that are part of my experience are not because my mind is limited in that way, but it's because I have these afflicted states that are obscuring this potential, that are obscuring this innate potential. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll just briefly, um, we haven't really introduced the idea of dedication practice, but we did kind of set a positive motivation at the beginning. And so it's also quite common at the end to offer our effort to, um, and this serves as an antidote to clinging to or grasping at feeling like we did something that can, that can feed our ego. Um, our, our spiritual practice can actually uh, get co-opted by the ego if we think, oh, I did a really great thing. What a great practitioner I am. What a great student I am. So we try to offer at the end of any virtuous activity, offer that for the benefit of others to just give it away and not cling on to it so that it, so that it doesn't feed our ego. So in whatever way you like, just try to feel that you've created positive energy and that you hope uh, and that you dedicate that that energy ripen for the benefit of all sentient beings. <laughs> 